Emmanuel Macron, the man who defied the odds to win the French presidency, is about to be sworn into office. We'll have live coverage from Paris. Also, North Korea in the news testing another ballistic missile. Missile. We have reaction from the Korean Peninsula and why Russia says it is also concerned. And the global cyber hack that locked up tens of thousands of computers has stopped spreading, but that might only be temporary. A live report on that ahead. It is 4 a.m. on the U.S. East Coast. We want to welcome our viewers here in the United States and all around the world. I'm George Howell, live at CNN World Headquarters in Atlanta. And I'm Hannah Vaughan-Jones, live for you here in London, where it's just gone 9 o'clock this Sunday morning. Thanks for joining us. This is CNN Newsroom. Welcome. A political transition is underway this hour in France. These are live pictures from just outside the Elysee Paris. Dignitaries have gathered there in the French capital, of course, for the, for the inauguration of the president-elect Emmanuel Macron. He is set to arrive very shortly at the Elysee Palace, his new home, where he will then take over, of course, from the current French President François Hollande. Well, our Paris correspondent, Melissa Bell, is in the French capital and joins us now with the very latest. Uh, Melissa, we can expect all of the pomp and ceremony that you might expect from the French when it comes to these sorts of inauguration events. Talk us through, though, the protocol. What can we expect over the next couple of hours? You're right, Hannah. There is a great deal of protocol on these occasions. It is a handover of a lot of power from one man to another. And every time these things are absolutely very carefully calibrated, who's been invited to the Elysee Palace today, how uh, Emmanuel Macron will make his way up the red carpet, how he will enter the Elysee, be received by François Hollande. All of these things are perfectly calibrated, timed, uh, organized, orchestrated. Uh, what is different this time, though, is uh, the sort of leap into the unknown that France will be taking with Emmanuel Macron as he makes his way into the Elysee Palace. This is a man, Hannah, who has really, as you said, defied the odds, put aside the mainstream political parties, shaken up France's political system, and now needs to get members of parliament in June's legislative elections, uh, who needs to appoint uh, 15 ministers by uh, Wednesday from uh, either the mainstream right or the mainstream uh, left. Uh, but all of this is a complete mystery and, as I say, something of a leap in the dark. You're seeing there Emmanuel Macron, as he arrives, he's just pulled up outside the Elysee Palace there uh, and he will uh, be uh, seen out of uh, the car. He will make his way up the red carpet towards François Hollande that you can see him at the end of the red carpet. Uh, the two men will, once Emmanuel Macron has made his way inside, uh, go into a private room where state secrets will be handed from the outgoing president to the incoming president, along with uh, things like the nuclear codes. Now, the reason this is such an unusual uh, uh, image that you're seeing today is that Emmanuel Macron, the man who was so spectacularly uh, uh, seen to triumph in uh, the presidential election, the second round of voting uh, last week, really was a a man who used to be uh, economy minister. He'd been appointed by François Hollande uh, a few years ago, served for two years before standing aside and then launching his own political movement. He was seen as having betrayed François Hollande in doing that. Uh, now, François Hollande, over the course of the last week, has really been seeking to bring him back into the fold, explain that he's here to show him uh, the road to take. But this is one man who betrayed another who's now making his way up that carpet to take over the presidency from him, Hannah. These are extraordinary images at the best of times, but this time uh, all the more important with uh, the fate of France really hanging in the balance since Emmanuel Macron has vowed to shake things up, has vowed not only to reform France, but profoundly to change the way that it is governed. Melissa, extraordinary pictures. We're really seeing all this ceremony from uh, outside the Elysee Palace. We've just seen, of course, as you say, the president-elect being greeted by the current president and then entering into that palace behind. Uh, you talked a little bit, Melissa, about... Uh, Macron's meteoric rise, really, to ascend to the presidency. Uh, he's going to have to hit the ground running, though, doesn't he? Because up until now, he hasn't even had a party. And he's, of course, got these legislat legislative elections taking place next month. You're absolutely right, Hannah. He will have no time to lose, all the more so because the expectations of the French people are so great. There has been this huge frustration in France for many years, not only the five years uh, that François Hollande spent in the Elysee Palace, and he leaves today as one of the most, as the most unpopular president uh, since the start of the Fifth Republic in 1958, but also uh, the, uh, the Nicolas Sarkozy's time in office, the five years that he spent, where he was seen to have failed to reform in the way that France needed to reform. There's been this sense that 
that France has really been uh, stuck with a flagging economy, with a political system dominated by political elites that simply have not done the business. That is what Emmanuel Macron uh, won on, a pledge uh, to change all that, to change the faces of those who govern France and to change the way that France is governed in order that finally it can be reformed. So he's got these huge expectations on his shoulder and he's going to have to hit the ground running, as you say, with not a single MP to his name and with ministers that he's going to have to choose very carefully, either to keep the political parties happy or to stick to his pledge of renewing the faces that are in power and choosing people from civil society. Hannah. Expecting perhaps that he will name his prime minister uh, tomorrow, as early as tomorrow. So, as you say, really getting down to the job very, very quickly indeed. Melissa Bell is live for us in Paris as we stay uh, with these inauguration uh, pictures of Emmanuel Macron. This is our main story today, and we will, of course, as soon as we see the president-elect and the current, uh, former president, President uh, Francois Hollande, as soon as we see them again emerging from their, their talks in the Elysee Palace, then we will, of course, come back to this story. Melissa, for now, thank you. Now to North Korea, that country launching another ballistic missile. This time it flew about 700 kilometers or 400 miles. The missile landed in the Sea of Japan, also known as the East Sea. The U.S. says that it did not threaten the continental United States and that it doesn't appear to be an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, this is the first launch from Pyongyang since a new South Korean president was sworn in just a few days ago. We have full coverage on this, starting now with Alexandra Field live in Seoul, South Korea. It's good to have you with us, Alexandra. So again, this happened at a time of transition in that nation uh, with a new president in office. This is a person, though, who favored more engagement with North Korea, now faced with this. Uh, certainly significant timing here, George. Look, officials from all countries involved are still closely analyzing the trajectory of this missile, trying to understand what its capability may have been. We know it landed in the waters off the uh, coast of the Korean Peninsula, but closer to Russia than Japan, uh, which has not been the pattern of some of the more recent missile launches. But this is certainly the kind of security situation uh, that President Moon Jae-in is having to weigh in on and weigh in on quickly. He likely anticipated he would need to. Again, this is at least the 10th ballistic missile launch that North Korea has conducted just since the start of the year, and it comes just a few days uh, into President Moon Jae-in's tenure uh, in that office. He was the Democratic Party candidate, I'll remind our viewers, who campaigned on a platform of greater engagement with North Korea in order to achieve the goal of denuclearization here on the peninsula. In the wake of this ballistic missile launch, he has, of course, met with the National Security Council. Uh, that is routine in the wake of these kinds of events. He has strongly, of course, condemned the launch, as is the practice of officials in his position here in South Korea. And he has gone on to say uh, that the South needs to show the North that talks can only be achieved uh, if North Korea creates the right kind of conditions for that to happen. That's actually, frankly, quite similar to what a high-level North Korean diplomat said just yesterday, uh, saying that North Korea could at one point be open to talks or willing to have some kind of talks uh, if the conditions were right. And that is also similar to what we've heard from Washington in recent weeks, where they have have held the door open for the possibility of talks with North Korea if certain steps could be met uh, to show that North Korea would be serious about denuclearization. In the wake of this latest launch, George, you've got officials in Washington uh, now again calling on all countries to strictly enforce sanctions against North Korea. When they make that kind of call, they are, of course, looking at China. China is key to President Trump's strategy of isolating North Korea in order to force cooperation. China is, of course, the largest trade partner with North Korea. And, George, if the timing already seemed pretty suspect for this launch, it also comes at a time when Chinese President Xi Jinping is hosting a trade summit in Beijing that's being attended by world leaders, including a North Korean delegation and the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Officials in China have condemned the latest launch, but they're calling for restraint from all parties. George? the reaction there. Alexandra Field live. Thank you so much. Uh, setting us up for Matthew Chance, bringing him in now live in Moscow. Matthew, you just heard Alexandra pointing out, uh, you know, the fact that the Russian president is in China for this major gathering of leaders of this uh, trade and infrastructure initiative by China. At the same time, if, if we could pull up the map here, Matthew, just to give our viewers a sense of, again, where this fell, uh, this is near Russian soil. So, Matthew, uh, what are you hearing? What reaction are you hearing from the Kremlin? 
No, well, the, the summary action, as you're right, it's a little, little difficult because Vladimir Putin is in Beijing right now, as, as we just heard. Uh, but his spokesman has issued a statement uh, saying that uh, the Russian president is concerned about the recent uh, missile uh, launch, uh, and, uh, and that's something they've been speaking with the Chinese leadership about. There's also been a statement uh, which has been carried by the Russian state news agency, one of them, uh, from the head of the Defence Committee of the Upper House of the Russian Parliament. His name is Viktor Ozerov, and he said that the air defence systems in the far eastern region of the Russian Federation, which is near uh, where this, this missile landed in the Sea of Japan, sort of a, a distance off the, off the Russian coast, those air defences have been placed on high alert, um, not because they feel there is any kind of intentional threat from North Korea. Remember that, that Russia and North Korea have a relatively strong uh, political relationship. They're, they're kind of friends. Um, and so the Russians say that they understand that Russia is not the target of these missiles, but nevertheless, they've got the security of their citizens to think of, and they've put their anti-missile defenses on high alert in that eastern part of, of, of Russia as well. Uh, and so, yeah, the, there has been a significant reaction, I think, at this point uh, from the Russians. They've expressed many times in the past that they are concerned about North Korea's development of, of, of long-range missiles and of nuclear capabilities, and they've expressed that concern again. You mentioned that the two are friends, so what, what is the uh, sway that Russia has over North Korea? Do they have any... Uh leverage here when, when it comes to missile launches like this? Well, I, well, I don't want to exaggerate the extent to which they're, they're friends or the extent to which they have influence over North Korea, but they, they have embassies in each other's countries, for instance. There, there have been visits by the leaders of both countries in the past, state visits to each other, which is rare from a North Korean uh, point of view, of course. And there's a certain amount of, of, of economic um, uh, you know, to and froing that goes between these two countries. It's been stepped up actually recently with at least 50,000 permits uh, for North Korean workers to, to work inside uh, Russia. They often work in logging camps or on construction sites and return their, their salaries directly to the uh, North Korean um, uh, government. And in the past, of course, historically, the Soviet Union was the main backer of North Korea before its collapse in the early 1990s, at which point China uh, took over that, that leading role. So there is a historical connection between the two uh, countries. And, of course, Russia has a, a strong interest in playing an important role in resolving this diplomatic dispute because, again, it puts Vladimir Putin at the center of international diplomacy once again and he absolutely relishes that Matthew Chance live for us in Moscow thank you so much for the report we'll stay in touch with you as well we turn to Iraq now and officials there say Isis now controls just 10% of the city of Mosul after months of fighting there but the most difficult part of the battle still lies ahead CNN's Ben Wiedemann has more from inside Mosul we need to warn you, the images in his report may be disturbing to some of our viewers, but we feel it's important to show you the realities on the ground. From a rooftop, a soldier fires toward ISIS positions. The struggle to liberate the city from ISIS is now well into its seventh grueling month of street-by-street, house-by-house fighting. The end is near but not near enough. Iraqi soldiers drape two dead ISIS fighters over the hood of their Humvees like hunting trophies, taking selfies to mark the occasion. This is what has become of their so-called caliphate, the one they swore was here to stay and destined to expand. Locally made bazookas litter the streets. ISIS ran dozens of workshops in residential areas to manufacture these and other weapons. It's a complete factory making anti-tank and anti-personnel rockets, this officer tells me. Only 10% of Mosul remains under ISIS control, but taking the last 10% won't be easy. Where that black smoke is rising is the Sebat Ash Tammuz, the 17th of July neighborhood. It's that neighborhood that ISIS entered first in June of 2014. They renamed the neighborhood Fatah to commemorate the early conquest of the Islamic Empire. Commanders here say the battle for Sabatash Tammuz is going to be the hardest one. Lieutenant Colonel Abu Fatima has been speaking by phone with residents inside the neighborhood. 
Tragic is how he describes their plight. They have no food, no water, no medical care. They're just waiting for our forces to free them. Some could wait no longer, risking death to escape. We left early this morning after taking cover for days in the bathroom, says Sina. Our menfolk told us, go, go. We said we can't because of the shelling. But then we put our faith in God and we left. Abu Said never fled the adjacent district of Musherfa, hiding with his family under a stairwell, waiting for Iraqi forces to move in. Now he's leading them from one abandoned ISIS house to another. I gathered information for the past three years, he says. I watched them, I wrote down their names, I kept an eye on what they were doing. And now I'm sharing everything with the officers. Senior commanders inspecting weapons seized from ISIS are confident victory will be achieved before the end of May. God willing, says Iraqi Chief of Staff Uthman al ghanmi we will triumph before Ramadan and declare the liberation of Mosul and its people from the filthy scum of ISIS. Those filthy scum, as he calls them, haven't given up yet, however, as this incoming sniper round inches from our camera shows. Well, Ben joins me now from Erbil in northern Iraq. Ben, the final push for Mosul, perhaps the bloodiest part of the battle, though, still to come, not just for Iraqi forces, but for the civilians trapped there still. That's right, Hannah. Well, we understand that this morning, Iraqi forces, including the Counterterrorism Service, the Federal Police, and the 9th Armored Division of the Iraqi Army, have entered four neighborhoods in western Mosul, including the 17th of July neighborhood uh, we featured in this package. So they do definitely appear uh, to be pushing ahead, and perhaps they may indeed uh, have this operation over by the beginning of Ramadan, which roughly coincides with the 27th of May. But of course, the real concern is, it's believed there are hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as 400,000 civilians uh, still inside. One officer told us they are eating grass, some of the people. Uh, they're so short of food. And of course, basic municipal services no longer exist in the ISIS-controlled parts of Mosul. There is no electricity. There is no running water. There is nothing in the way of medical services. So their situation is extremely dire. And this is one of the principal concerns of humanitarian organizations who have scrambled uh, to deal with the number of people who fled the city. When this operation began in the middle of February to liberate western Mosul, uh, NGOs were saying they expected perhaps as many as 250,000 residents of the western part of the city fleeing. At this point, the number is more than 425,000, and it's growing every day, the number of those who have fled the city. Anna? A dire situation indeed. Ben, we appreciate your very brave reporting on the situation in Mosul. Thank you very much. Now, do stay with us here on CNN Newsroom. Coming up after the break, President Trump says the search for a new FBI director is moving quickly. He could even make a final decision within days. And the FBI firing controversy was apparently on the president's mind when he addressed graduating students this weekend. What's he advising those students to do? That's next. I'm Francine. I'm a freediver. In such busy times, finding a moment to unwind and be at peace is as rare as a place like Mauritius. Mauritius, now my heart belongs to you. known for its bounty of beautiful beaches. But there's much more to the Philippines. Come with us to explore ancient customs and new flavors. Gaze at the curious and the spectacular. We're island hopping to seek out the country's hidden treasures. Destination Philippines, Saturday on CNN.
Paddock on CNN.com forward slash motorsport. This weekend, the Spanish Grand Prix in association with DHL. Thriving in the business world is all about making decisions. Lost in the maze of choices. Stocks, bonds, commodities, raising capital. Turn one corner, an economic boom. Around another, recession and bust. On Quest Means Business, I'll be your guide through this labyrinth. Meander no more. Together, we forge ahead with direction, with confidence. Quest Means Business, Tuesday through Saturday on CNN. Ah, success in the maze of business. What a profitable day. Donald Trump proclaimed America first. Some serious fighting is going down. Let's talk about what's motivating this vote. You see what happened in Britain. You still think it's what France needs? waters and purple forests near bright white walls and rocks of orange in neon cities on sun-drenched sands in the middle of everywhere is the heart of somewhere by icons landmarks valleys and skylines near pillars of glass and on top of them too it's the places you've dreamed of and where dreams come true. When you live for adventure and discover hidden charms. When you're warm on the inside, when it's warm on the outside. Because moments make memories and faraway places are closer than you think. Going places together with Qatar Airways. Welcome back. The search is on for a new FBI chief to replace ousted director James Comey, who was, of course, abruptly fired last week by President Donald Trump. The replacement could be any of these eight candidates, all interviewed on Saturday. More interviews are possible today, Sunday. Mr. Trump, speaking to reporters aboard Air Force One, said the vetting process is going very quickly. I think the process is going to go quickly because uh, almost all of them are very well known. So, you know, they've been vetted over their lifetime, essentially. But very well-known, highly respected, really talented people. And that's what we want for the FBI. So I'll see you over at the school. Have a good time. Thank you, Mr. President. But again, the president fired uh, the person who was overseeing the investigation into possible Russian ties into the Trump campaign and possibly into the Trump administration. So to talk more about this, bringing in now Scott Lucas, a professor of international politics at the University of Birmingham in England. Always a pleasure to have you with us, Scott. So, uh, you know, her you heard a moment ago the search is on for a replacement for James Comey. And again, let's take a look at the possible replacements. So far, a list of eight that we have, and there could be more on the way. Uh, you see here, Andrew McCabe is also among the list. Andrew McCabe is the acting director at this point, given that James Comey is out. But of that list, Scott, uh, and I know that you're well versed in, in the people there. Uh, so what do you think so far about the people the president is looking into? Well, it's a five wide sweep of candidates. Eight interviewed on Saturday, more to come, including actor director McCabe. And they offer each offer different possibilities and different questions. Uh, McCabe, to start with, uh, as acting director, is certainly there. He's qualified. He's up to speed on the inquiries into the possible links between the Trump administration and Russia. But of course, that might disqualify him from the start for the job, especially since he challenged Trump after Comey's dismissal by saying, no, uh, Mr. Comey did retain uh, the FBI's confidence or the confidence of the agents. If you take someone like John Cornyn, uh, senator from Texas, quite prominent, 
the problem here is he is so vocal a defender of Trump that any uh, prospective appointment raises questions as to whether the Trump administration is trying to shut down the FBI investigation. Uh, there are a couple of judges on the list who have very solid records, Michael Garcia, Henry Hudson, a couple of former Bush uh, administration officials, Alice Fisher, Francis Townsend, who headed up Homeland Security, a couple of former FBI agents. But I think the one candidate probably to watch out for at this point, without saying that anyone is a clear favorite, is probably Mike Rogers. Uh, Mike Rogers, a Republican who was head of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, who's a former FBI agent and who on Saturday was endorsed by the FBI Agents Association, which represents many within the Bureau. So Rogers, I think, if he passes the political test, that he's not coming in simply to shut down the Trump-Russia inquiry, may be able to appeal across both aisles uh, of the Senate, which will be necessary for any confirmation. And also important to point out the timing, uh, Director Comey, the former director, was actually ramping up the Russia investigation per reporting uh, when he was uh, terminated by the president, which was in the rights, uh, well within the, the, you know, the realm of, of ability of the president of the United States. Let's talk also about uh, Mr. Trump giving his first commencement address as president. Listen to just a bit of what he had to say uh, at the commencement ceremony of Liberty University, Scott. Uh, we can talk about it here on the other side. In my short time in Washington, I've seen firsthand how the system is broken. A small group of failed voices who think they know everything and understand everyone want to tell everybody else how to live and what to do and how to think. But you aren't going to let other people tell you what you believe, especially when you know that you're right. All right there, Scott, so you, you get a little insight here. So he's giving advice to, you know, people who are graduating, heading into, you know, uh, the business world, the, the world, you know, of workaday world, but at the same time giving some insight into his own uh, presidency. Oh, whenever Trump speaks, it's largely about Trump, let's be clear. So that clip you just heard, which is effectively, don't anyone tell you you're not right, and then earlier in the speech talking about a small failing group in Washington uh, that was trying to tear everything down. You know, Trump's idea that on the one hand he's playing the victim, that he's under assault from the fake media, he's under assault from political opponents, but on the other hand saying, I command this large majority of support um, in the fact that I am right, that I have this, uh, this self-belief. Well, clearly both can't be true. He can't be simply victimized by, you know, basically all these powerful forces at the same time, only be facing a very small group of recalcitrants. But that's Trump. I mean, you don't look for logic here. You look for the fact that this is a man who will never say he's wrong, will never admit any type of mistake, which in part accounts for the fact that whether or not you think he's right or wrong, he is going to continue this type of defiance, whether it's over the firing of James Comey, whether it's of the Trump-Russia inquiry, whether it's any of his economic or foreign policy proposals. Scott Lucas, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. This is CNN Newsroom and still ahead, a cyber attack basically locked down thousands of computers in dozens of countries around the world. We'll tell you how an expert, though, finally stopped it. Stay with us. The Dan Gote Group stands at the forefront of African enterprise. Since 1978, we've touched the lives of millions of people by meeting their basic needs. Our belief in the promise of Africa has taken us into 14 African countries. With substantial investments that will propel the continent towards greater prosperity, promising jobs, improved standards of living and economic growth. Dan Gote, for an empowered Africa.
Tonight, President Trump versus James Comey. The fired FBI director is threatened with possible tapes of their meetings, while new details of Trump's attempt to get a loyalty pledge from him emerge. Senator Chuck Schumer joins Jake Live, State of the Union, tonight on CNN. Tonight on CNN, the Comey fallout continues. The firing, the investigations, the threat, and the outrage. Could we be looking at the new Watergate? For Reed and the panel debate. For Reed Zakaria GPS. Tonight on CNN. Join me, Kate Baldwin, for the latest in U.S. politics. We have smart discussions and a whole lot of fun. State of America, Tuesday through Friday on CNN. And get more State of America on the new podcast. Subscribe now with your favorite app. Because leaving home doesn't mean living less. Stay at a hotel that has the news source you trust. Stay at a CNN Partner Hotel. Business is always changing. Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. Weeknights only on CNN. I'm Linda Kincaid in Atlanta, and this is CNN. Welcome back to our viewers here in the United States and all around the world. You're watching CNN Newsroom. I'm George Howell, live in Atlanta. And I'm Hannah Vaughan Jones, live for you in London. Just uh, gone 9.30 this Sunday morning. The headlines for you. The inauguration of Emmanuel Macron is underway this hour in Paris. The French president-elect is currently at the Elysee Palace. You're looking at live pictures of it right now. He's inside there meeting with the outgoing president, Francois Hollande. The centrist Macron is a former investment banker and economy minister. He, of course, defeated the far-right candidate, Marine Le Pen, in a runoff election held just last week. The U.S. says a ballistic missile that North Korea launched early Sunday does not appear to be an intercontinental ballistic missile. It landed in the Sea of Japan, that's also known as the East Sea. A senior North Korean diplomat tells a South Korean news agency the North is open to dialogue with the U.S., quote, under the right conditions. Chinese President Xi Jinping has opened a two-day summit aimed at expanding trade links between China and Europe, Africa and Asia. 1,500 delegates and 29 heads of state and government leaders are at the Belt and Road Initiative. Beijing itself hopes to build a new so-called Silk Road of ports, railways and roads to vastly expand trade. Eurovision crowns its 2017 <laughs> winner. Portugal's, Portugal's Salvador Sabral won the world's most popular singing contest with a song written by his sister. It's the first win for Portugal in the competition's 61-year history. More than 200 million people around the world watched that event last year. And no doubt millions watched it this year as well. Now, an international cyber attack has been stopped thanks to a security expert here in the UK, thousands of computers were getting error messages like this one, demanding a ransom to use the system again. The UK even had to call a crisis meeting after the attack froze files at several hospitals across the country, forcing those hospitals to turn away patients. Well, the British Home Secretary says this is no small software bug. If you look at who's been impacted by this virus, it's a huge variety across different industries and across different international governments. This is a virus that has attacked window platforms. The fact is the NHS has fallen into the in, in, fallen victim to this. I don't believe it's to do with their preparedness. There's always more we can all do to make sure that we're secure against viruses. But I think that there had already been good preparations in place, place by the NHS to make sure that they were ready for this sort of attack. Phil Black following this story for us in London and joins me now live from Downing Street in the heart of Westminster. Phil, um, the virus is stopped for now, but the threat 
as we're hearing, is far from over. Uh, potentially, that's right, Hannah. That's what we're hearing from online security experts who say that further malware attacks could follow reasonably quickly. We're also hearing that same warning from the young online security researcher who was responsible for inadvertently stopping the spread of this particular malware. This is a 22-year-old. We don't know if it's a man or a woman. Uh, it goes by the name of uh, Malware Tech Online, was studying the uh, malware and noticed that it was reporting back frequently to a strange web domain, an internet address that was unregistered. So this person registered uh, that web domain, took control of it for about $10, and in doing so, inadvertently triggered some sort of kill switch which stopped the malware from spreading further. So an accidental hero. But this person is also saying that it would be relatively simple to rewrite the code and effectively relaunch the malware and that that could happen within the next week or so. Hannah. Uh, and any idea yet, Phil, who might be responsible for this, this global cyber attack? No, not specifically. So this is something that's going to be investigated at an international level. As you can imagine, almost 100 countries affected tens and tens of thousands of computers uh, around the world. Here in Britain, the key question is, how is this able to happen? How is it able to have such a big effect, particularly on the country's national health system, where some 20% of hospitals uh, and health facilities uh, were impacted by uh, the malware. The British government is saying, as you heard there from the Home Secretary, that they think they were simply caught up in this big global event. It wasn't a question of uh, a lack of preparedness. But we also know that the security patch for this particular vulnerability uh, within the Microsoft platform, well, that was released back in March. So clearly not all of the IT within the NHS was up to date and what this means for patients well they're the ones that are really being inconvenienced by this the hospitals are getting back to normal now we're told almost all of them but for patients it's a process of waiting to hear when their appointments and surgeries and procedures can be rescheduled and because of the nature of waiting lists here it also means that there'll be a knock-on effect so other patients could also be inconvenienced their health uh, their, their actual health care is being uh, interrupted in this way now of course it's all particularly sensitive at the moment because we're in the middle of a general election campaign here so the British government is keen to to push back and say no this wasn't a failure of our making but from the main opposition parties here what we are hearing uh, are questions about how this was able to happen uh, and some of them are demanding some sort of formal inquiry as well Hannah Phil great to talk to you Phil back life was there on Downing Street thank you now, do stay with us. Coming up, we are going to be taking you back to Paris for plenty more on the presidential inauguration of Emmanuel Macron. These are live pictures right now from the Elysee Palace, expecting to see Macron and his uh, predecessor, Francois Hollande, emerge from the Elysee Palace, that front porch, in the next couple of minutes. You have every provision of this bill tattooed on your forehead. Tuesday, Nancy Pelosi, the leader of the Democratic opposition in the House. Chris Cuomo moderates a live CNN town hall. Tuesday on CNN. Next time on Vital Signs, unlocking stem cells potential all over the world, from Europe to the United States. You inject them in a the heart, they learn from the living heart cells what to become. If you inject them in a the knee, they become cartilage. See the impact these experimental studies could have on the treatment of autism. Before this study, autism affected probably 75% of our day, and now autism maybe affects 10%. Vital Signs, Wednesday on CNN, in association with Dubai Healthcare City. This whole journey that I've taken goes back to what I grew up with. Filipino hospitality has to do with always wanting to nurture and to feed. Every part of the Philippines has this wealth of not only ingredients, but cooking styles that just says so much about how rich the cuisine is. Culinary Journeys, Thursday on CNN. Our planet's future hangs in the balance. We need to find solutions for Earth's big issues. Solutions to fight deforestation, to produce renewable energy, to clean our oceans and air, and solutions to revitalize our cities. On Eco Solutions, we talk to people who are taking steps to help balance our environmental challenges and who show us how to make better choices every day. Eco Solutions, Saturday on CNN. All new Inside Africa. Unlocking the mysteries behind the continent you thought you knew.
A town famous for wine growing transforms into a mountain biking mecca. If you can get through the Cape Epic, you kind of regard it as somebody that can get through through most of it. Inside Africa, Tuesday, only on CNN, in association with Zenith Bank. For somebody to, to tell you their story, it's, it's something I take really seriously. And it's not something you can just parachute in and ask somebody to open their heart to you. To peel away the layers, to get to the heart of the person who you're telling a story about. France will never give up against the tourists. And delve beneath the surface of what's happening. You can hear their story, and you're going to do their story justice. You have to show yourself to them. How high was the water? The water was as, as tall as that tree. CNN's the right place to tell their story. Brexit has won. America first. CNN has the man to cut through all of this noise. I'm Wolf Blitzer in Washington. And ask the important questions. I want to bring in our panel to talk a little bit more. Wolf, Tuesday through Saturday on CNN. Welcome back to CNN Newsroom. We now return live to France for the presidential inauguration of Emmanuel Macron. You see these live images there, just there at the Elysee Palace. We're waiting at the moment to see the president-elect Emmanuel Macron and the soon-to-be outgoing president Francois Hollande uh, to stand there in front of the Elysee Palace. And it is the beginning of a long day for them. Uh, this is the handoff of power. Uh, that is a process there in France. Again, let's bring in Melissa Bell, who is live following this as well. Melissa, uh, what more uh, can you tell us about where we are right now in this process? Oh, really on the brink of a new political era here in France. I don't think it's an, an exaggeration, George, to put it that way. Emmanuel Macron is coming in with all this promise, all these expectations on his shoulders, expectations of 66% of the population who chose to back this relative political novice. He, of course, knows the Elysee Palace because he worked there as a councillor to Francois Hollande for a couple of years before being appointed economy minister. But today, he returned in triumph, uh, walking up that red carpet through the main door of the Elysee to greet, be greeted by the outgoing president, François Hollande, the man that he was very much seen to have betrayed uh, just a few months ago when he announced that he would be standing without the backing of the Socialist Party for the presidency. Now, that political gamble paid off spectacularly last Sunday. The two men are now inside the Elysee Palace for one of those meetings that take place every time there is this transfer of power. And it's been this way since the start of the Fifth Republic in 1958. The two men meet alone in a room, and the outgoing president hands to the incoming president state secrets and the nuclear codes. And you'd love to be a fly on the wall for this particular meeting. Uh, so momentous is this particular transition of power. Francois Hollande is about to walk out of that meeting to leave the Elysee Palace as the most unpopular president since the start of the Fifth Republic. Uh, also a man who is handing over not so much to a political opponent since uh, Emmanuel Macron did serve as economy minister, but definitely to a political novice and also to a man who represents neither of the mainstream parties. He's really seen them off over the course of this political campaign. Hence this very interesting relationship between the man he's seen to have betrayed in order to stand uh, and uh, this, uh, also this sense that Emmanuel Macron comes in with these expectations on his shoulders. He's really promised to shake up uh, the political landscape here in France even more than he has done already by uh, putting in place not so much people that we've come to know as the political elites that dominate France's landscape, but political novices. He wants to have people from what he describes as civil society, people who've had real jobs, not career politicians. And that's what we're going to see, an, see announced over the coming days. So a real political sort of democratic revolution that we're witnessing here at the Elysee Palace today, George. And Melissa, it's Hannah in London. As we await these two men emerging from the Elysee Palace, as you were just saying, I'm intrigued about the, the vehicle that will be taking Francois Hollande away. It seems a very kind of understated car they're waiting for him and perhaps uh, in line with the, 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 the way he's going out of his Elysee Palace and presidential role as well, as you say, with the lowest approval rating really in history. I think that's right, Hannah. He goes out with those historically low approval ratings, also with a sense he's been talking about over the course of the last few days of having to face what he has described himself as the emptiness that will follow having been in the Elysee Palace. So there is this sense that what we're witnessing today is extremely carefully choreographed. The handover of power is full of very carefully thought through and orchestrated protocol. But there is also this emotion in this day and the emotion of Francois Hollande as he leaves the Elysee Palace, not only leaving 
behind the power that he held, but really leaving behind a changed political landscape. His own party, the Socialist Party, lies in ruins as a result of what's happened over the course of the last few months, as a result of the political, the extraordinary political ascension of Emmanuel Macron as well. So perhaps even more emotion, even greater sadness than in a usual transfer of power as François Hollande prepares uh, to leave. When he emerges from that meeting with Emmanuel Macron, he will be seen off by the incoming president, taken to the end uh, of the red carpet and allowed to get into that car in order to leave. Emmanuel Macron himself, then, Hannah, is going to have an incredibly busy day. He will come back into the Elysee pa Palace, having said goodbye to François Hollande, uh, in order uh, to have the Legion of Honor bestowed on him, in order to have the official results of the election read out, and in order to be made officially France's new president. Well, Isabel, uh, stand by for just a moment. Let's take a live look again at this image, just full screen again. 10.45 there in Paris, 4.45 here on the east coast of the United States. And again, we're waiting to see the uh, president-elect, Emmanuel Macron, soon to step there in front of the Elysee Palace uh, with the outgoing president, Francois Hollande. Again, this is a process that will uh, pass through the day. Of course, we'll be watching this play out. Melissa Bell is live following this. And Melissa, I want to ask you, you were describing the political landscape here. So again, uh, this was a political gamble that paid off, as you described it, uh, getting to this office. But now, this is an incoming president who, you know, really, does he know who his allies are when it comes to trying to get things done? Because this is a person who uh, represents a rebuke of the uh, formal parties that, that are there in place uh, in France. He's coming in with, with new, new territory here. That, that's exactly right, George. And what had been, in a sense, a personal gamble over the course of the last few months now becomes a national gamble as uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, is sworn in as France's new president. I mean, no one had expected that this man would come anywhere near the second round of voting, never mind go on uh, to win. When he announced his candidature all those months ago, it was seen very much as a betrayal of François Hollande. But people had expected, you know, that uh, he, he wouldn't win at the time. It's difficult to remember it now, but the Republic uh, uh, the Republican candidate was very much the favorite to win. Of course, no one could have expected that François Fillon would be seen off as a result of the judicial troubles that he came to face. No one could imagine that the Socialist Party would veer so far to the left in its primary with a choice of the candidate Benoit Hamon as to make itself essentially unelectable and fairly unpalatable even to members of its own uh, ranks. Uh, this, of course, opened the way, created a boulevard for Emmanuel Macron down the center of French politics, which traditionally has not really managed uh, to make it to any form of power. It created a boulevard that led him all the way to Elysee. Now that personal gamble very much becomes one for the nation, since uh, everything hangs now on Emmanuel Macron's ability uh, to uh, appoint 15 ministers over the next couple of days, including, crucially, a prime minister uh, that can go on to carry out his program of reform. The other part of the equation will be managing to get his candidates elected in next month's parliamentary elections. For the time being, he doesn't have a single one to his name, George. He wants to get a majority uh, in order to be able to govern and reform France, as he's promised he will do. My colleague Hannah Von Jones here along with me uh, in London. I'm here in Atlanta. We're there with Melissa Bell live in Paris. And again, we're watching history uh, there in France. This live image at 10.47 a.m. there as that nation soon brings in a president-elect who will soon be the president of France. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break.